your hand in your Bible while I chew my sweet. So this is God's holy word. Supernaturally inspired by the Holy Spirit. Quibus is anointed to teach me tonight. I have all ears to hear. And I will have a life-changing experience. Amen. Right, Matthew 6. Okay, this is the third in the series. I'll start talking about having the faith of Christ. And I believe some people got a supernatural revelation out of the book of Galatians and out of the book of Ephesians. The faith, we all have faith in Jesus. And out of the book of Galatians, we learned that our faith in Christ makes us all children of God. That's what the book of Galatians says. But the faith of Jesus makes us sons of God. What is the difference? A child says, Papa, Mama, and he can't do anything. He just, you know, Papa, Mama. A son is a matured one, and he gets commands, and he starts doing stuff. So the whole creation is waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God, not for the children of God. Sons of God in the New Testament mean matured and perfect. So the whole world, the, the book of Hebrews says in chapter 6, let us go on to perfection. So we should not stay children because Galatians 4 says, if we stay children, we differ nothing from slaves. But if we become sons, we have the spirit of the son in us crying, Abba, Father, then are we heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. In other words, everything that Jesus is and has becomes ours. And that's why he said, the works that I do shall you do also, and greater works than these shall you do. I mean, we see miracles like I don't know how many people see it this way we see it. You know, crutches, wheelchairs, cancers, HIV, and there's no boasting about it. It just happens. People getting, you know, supernatural breakthroughs in businesses, selling houses, you know, getting breakthroughs in deals coming through, in law cases coming to their favor. God is just doing the most awesome. Why? Because we're stepping from childhood to manhood, from faith in Christ to the faith of Christ. And it's so great if you read in the, in, in the epistles, every time where it says the faith of Christ, it just breaks you through in a fresh revelation. You know, it says in the Bible, there is no more Jew, no more Greek, no more bond, no more free, no more man, no more female, but all are one in Christ. Now, what we've been taught for years is we are all one in Christ. But if you go and study that word, it says we are all one. So if you're a Jew, a Greek, a bond or a free, a man or a woman, when you are in Christ, you are one with him. He doesn't say we are one. You become one with Christ because he says the promise was made to one and that's the seed and that one is Christ. But if we are Christ, then we become the seed. We become one. What one? We become the same as the Christ. We become the anointed. We become the heirs. We become the joint heirs. We become the fellow brothers. We become the people that get what Jesus came to do. We get the fullness because we are one. Not one. I mean, if I must be one with you, I, I can't look like you. Do you want to look like me? I don't want to look like you. I mean, I don't want to have what other people have. I want to be me. But I can be one with Christ. But I can't be one with everybody. We will always have differences. You know, different hairstyles, different clothes, different cars. You know, some like Uno, some like Lamborghinis. You know, I don't know. You know, it just differs. Okay, so, did you, did you get the revelation of the one? I think that was a supernatural revelation because for many years, the church tried to be one. If we can just be one, instead of trying to be one with Christ, then automatically there will be unity in the church. It's not that we become one and the Jew is now the same as the Gentile. No, brother, Jew is still a Jew. Greek is still a Greek. You can go listen to them. Portuguese is still Portuguese. Twana is still Twana. They can try and get white as much as they are. They still stay Twanas. Twana. White people, you can lay in the sun and try and get dark. You still stay white, man. You know, so we don't change because we become Christians. But we can be one with Christ no matter what color we are, no matter what race we are. And that's why the differences are lost. We become united in Christ but one with Christ. Verse 22. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thy eye be single, 
Thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you be darkness, how great is the darkness. Your eye is the light. Your eye must be single. In other words, it mustn't see two things at the same time because you're not a chameleon. You haven't got two brains, you only got one, but use the one you got, okay? But here's a good scripture, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, you can only listen, the ones that we're going to read, I'll tell you. But 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7 says the following, God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shone in our hearts the illumination of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure of the glory of of the light inside earthen vessels okay so we have the treasure okay another good word would be the mystery we have the mystery the treasure of the glory of god almighty in the face of jesus christ we have it inside earthen vessels okay? So right in us, a good scripture would be Colossians 1 verse 26. Listen to this. The mystery that's been hidden. Now, what is hidden? A treasure. The mystery that's been hidden throughout ages and generations is now revealed. Christ is in us. The hope of the real glory. Okay, so I have the treasure of the fullness, just listen to me, of the glory inside me. But it doesn't do any person good if I have the treasure and is hidden inside of me. It must come to a place where people can see the treasure. In other words, it must grow. And I think that's what we did last night in Galatians 4 verse 19, where it says, My beloved children, for whom I'm in travail again, till Christ be formed in you. So the treasure must not be just inside me. It must grow in my hands, in my feet, in my face. So when I am walking, it's not me walking, it's Christ walking. When I talk, it's not me talking, it's Christ talking. When I lay hands on people, it's not me, it's Christ. We got to mature, we got to be perfected, we got to grow into the... But Quibbles, we have it, we have it, we have it. Then show it. You know, it's not a talking thing, it's a walking thing. You know, it's good to have a lot of problems. Oh, we got it, you know, we are already, there is things, we are already perfect, we are already sanctified, we are already justified, but somehow it must manifest. You are the city that sits on a hill, you are the light of the world. Let your light so shine, says Matthew 5, verse 16, so that people will see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So the light which is in us is from our eye. Our eye must be single to have our body full of light. Okay? So Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Then Jesus says, you are the light of the world. So to let my light so shine that people will see the Christ, I've got to have my eye single. Okay? Can we read Hebrews chapter 12? No, Lisa is going to read it. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through, no, verse 2 and 3. Just verse 2 and 3. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God, for consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest he be wearied and faint in your minds. Right, listen to this. He says, we must have our eyes on Jesus. I mean, this is stuff we know, but it's going to get very great later on. Have your eyes on Jesus so that your mind does not grow weary. Go or grow weary and faint. In other words, no stress. How would you like? <laughs> this is good. How would you like a stressless life? Come on, everybody. No worries, no cares. Everything is just working fine. A okay. You're not number 10, you're number one. I mean, 
Okay, so the light of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye be single, your whole body shall be full of light. Let's read it in Luke chapter 11, verse 33. Okay, Annalise is going to do that, so you can just listen or you can go there too. Luke eleven thirty three, No man, when he had lighted a candle, put it in a secret place, neither under a bushel, but on a candlestick. Listen to that. If you light a candle, you put it on a candlestick. Okay? If you light a candle, you put it on a candlestick. You don't put it under a jug or a bushel. You put it on a candlestick. Now listen, here's the revelation. In Revelation chapter 2 and 3, Revelation 1, you know, John saw Jesus with seven stars and, you know, seven lamps and stuff like that. And in chapter 2, he comes and he tells us in chapter 1, he says, the seven stars are the seven angels to the seven churches. The seven lampstands, and if you read newer translations, I've got them in my office, the 26 translations, a lot of translations says, the seven candlesticks are the seven churches. So when Jesus spoke to them, there was the fire in, in Revelation 4 and 5, inside seven fires, seven fires, seven fires in front of the throne of God. But seven lampstands outside the Holy of Holies in the outer court. And he says to them, come up higher. Come get lamps on your candlesticks. So church, be the light of the world. And when John saw the revelation, the church were already just candlesticks. The torches were not on there. The candles were not burning. So no man lights a candle and put it under a bushel, but he put it on a candlestick. So let your light shine. You are the light of the world. But the eye is the light of the body. Your eye must be single. Read on. I gave you the verses there on the paper, I think. Mm. Neither under a bushel but on a candlestick that they which come in might see the light. Yeah. The light of the body is the eye. There it is again, you see. Therefore, when the eye is single, there you come. the whole body is full of light. But when the eye is evil, the body is full of darkness. Take heed, therefore, that the light which is in thee okay. be not that's dark. good enough so how do i become the light on the candlestick how do become i become the light where my whole body is full of light he says it again my eye must be single in other words i can't have double vision i must have single vision Come on, in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, remember the story? Jehoshaphat is in this great battle. Three armies are coming against him, plus all the other armies gathered with him. And you know, Jehoshaphat called all the people of Judah, all the children, the budgies, the bees, the flowers, the trees. Everybody had to fast. You know, nobody was excluded. You know? And Jehoshaphat set his face to seek the Lord. Listen to his prayer. O God of Abram, Isaac, and Jacob, are you not God that said... If we turn towards this place and pray in the time of war and pestilence, you will hear and deliver us. O oh God, in ourselves there is no might and no strength against these armies that's coming against us. But our eyes are fixed on you. And the minute he prayed it, the Bible says, and the Spirit of the Lord came into the congregation, and the prophet stood up and says, Fear not, you shall not fight. The Lord will fight for you. The battle is not yours. The battle is the Lord's. When did it happen? When they got single-eyed. Where were their eyes focused? On the great armies. Where were their eyes supposed to be? On the Lord Jesus Christ. I'll read you the two biggest scriptures that God gave me. It's a bit out of the... The, 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 the word, but you know, or, or out of our teaching, but it'll help you. Quickly go to Exodus 10 and Exodus 14. This helped me in 1987 and gave me a super breakthrough that I still have today. I tell you, man, I know when God gave me a breakthrough, I know when I was caught up and blessed by the Almighty God. This is going to be an awesome word for everybody. Okay. The firstborn of the Egyptians is now dead because of the last plague that God brought to get his people out of the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh and Moses is facing one another. He's now going to take the Israelites and go to the promised land. Verse 28. 
People, you've got to take this word. This was one of my greatest breakthroughs in 1987, and I still remember it today. I've mentioned it many times at our pool. Verse 28, And Pharaoh said to Moses, I'm reading Amplified, And Pharaoh said to Moses, Get away from me. See that you never enter my presence again. Listen to Pharaoh. For the day you see my face again, you shall die. And Moses said, you have spoken truly. I will never see your face again. You got to listen to this. Pharaoh says, get away. For the day you see my face again, you will die. Moses said, you speak rightly. I will never see your face again. A few days later, Red Sea. Oh my goodness, how are we going to cross this thing? Israelites cry out, forget the Red Sea. Look behind us. There's Egypt with all their armies. Pharaoh's coming with his chariots and they're going to destroy us. Look at Moses. Verse 13, because of what we just read in 1028. And Moses said unto the people, fear ye not. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord which he will show you this day. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you shall never see them again. No more forever. For the Lord shall fight for you and you shall hold your peace. Don't look back. Get your vision straight. Get somebody shouts. Get single eyed. Get focused on Jesus. Don't look to the left and look to the right. Come on, Annalise just read Hebrews 12 verse 2. Look away from all that will distract by looking unto Jesus so that you will not grow weary in your minds and faint. Okay, we're still in Matthew 6. Verse 30, in the same context, the word is truly going to bless many people. This is a context where he speaks on the, on the eye, the single eye. Wherefore, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast in the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Okay, Luke 12, 22. I'm just seeing the context there. Luke 12, 22. Okay, this is the same as we read now. Just listen to Luke. He said to his disciples, Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life. Okay, what you shall take eat, no thought for your life. Mm, listen. What you shall eat, what you shall, neither for your body, what you shall put on. The life is more than meat, and the body more than raiment. Okay. Take no thought for your life. I think that's good enough. I took it out of the interlinear Greek concordance, and this is what is get. Okay? I made a poster of it, for those who can remember, years ago in our old church. Do not take a thought that will cause you to worry and then make you to say. Okay. You getting it? Do not take a thought that will cause you to worry and then make you to say. In other words, thoughts come all the time. Oh, look at that. Look at the Egyptians. Look at the Syrians and the Moabites. Come on, Jehoshaphat. Look. Come on, Moses. Look. What did both of them say? Fear not. Stand still. See the salvation of the Lord. As you see your problems now, you will never see your problems again. But you've got to say, I'm not going to see their faces. I'm going to see the face of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to be single-eyed and my whole body will be full of light. I will not take a thought that will cause me to worry and then say, what are we going to eat tonight? How are we going to get clothes for the children? How are we going to put tires on the cars? How are we going to put pay the house this month? I'm going to say God is my refuge God is my strength God is my prosperity God is my peace he said he will supply all my needs and I'm going to stay he's going to supply I'm going to pray for that house I'm going to keep on speaking that is my house even if it takes 25 years I got the house hmm? 
It may sound simple to you, but I wish I could sit with you and explain it to you. Brother and sister, the Lord Jesus Christ loves you intensely, cares for you, but He only asks you to be single-eyed. And your whole body will be full of light. So if I'm the light of the world, I will cast out darkness. If I walk into the problem and I see there's my, oh, my house payment, I am shining light. Man, money's coming in to pay this house. I told you last Sunday how I paid for six dry boreholes on our property, you know, over 300,000 rand, and God gave me an amount of 114,000 when I was 35,000 rand overdraft in the bank, and the same night I prophesied, I said I had a dream, it's going to be 114, 114 was paid into my bank account, the guy phoned me the next morning, he said, you only have to pay me 114 for all the holes. Does God know you're going to have a dry borehole? Oh, you didn't understand. God knows about everything. He's God Almighty. <laughs> Matthew 14, this is the story. There was a great storm. And the Bible says, you've got to read in the Amplified and in the Kenneth E. Vuss translation, he said, and Jesus deliberately sent his disciples into a storm. <laughs> Jesus, are you okay? Jesus deliberately sends the disciples into a storm. My goodness, Jesus, how can you send me in a storm? To show you I can take you out of the storm. It depends on where you're going to look at. So here comes Jesus in the fourth night watch, by three o'clock in the morning, when everything is most ghostly. You know, when spooks are walking around. Mm -hmm. You know, when they come out of the tombs and visit your house, you know, three o'clock in the morning. It's junk, man. They sleep, they did. Okay, so, but three o'clock in the morning, here comes Jesus walking on the water. We all know the stories, but I'm getting to do to, to stuff that will really bless you. Here comes Jesus walking on the water. All the disciples says, a ghost. I mean, who walks on water? In a white robe. Three o'clock in the morning, when you are in a storm. Oh, I mean, I don't need a ghost. I'm in a storm. I need help, you know. I don't need a tranquilizer. I need a lifeboat, you know. You know? Jesus says, it is I. Fear not. All the disciples says ghost. Peter jumps up, gets his eyes. He says, if it's you, tell me that I can walk on water too. Jesus says, Come. Peter gets out of the boat and he starts walking. Then he changed his eyes, focus from Jesus, and he looks at the waves. And he starts thinking. Yeah, he didn't sink, he just started. So he's about knee deep. Help! Jesus grabbed him, and the Bible says, and they both walked to the other side. Okay, so, and this is what Jesus said. O oh, ye of little faith, why did you doubt? Okay, now let's go back to where we were in Matthew 6. If God can clothe the field, if God can clothe the grass, if God can feed the birds, how much more ye of little faith? So ye of little faith, why did you doubt? What is God trying to say? God is trying to say, if you have faith and doubt, you will have breakthroughs that will cease. Okay, I'll try it again. If you have faith and doubt together, you'll have breakthroughs that will only last for certain times. In other words, you'll see, wow, and the next day, yeah, I don't know, you know, I just started getting the money and then it stopped. You know, I, I, I tell you, this week I had four people at their house to buy it and everybody looked favorable. They went to the bank, not one of them came through. But I mean, you, you, you know, I just signed the papers, you know, I, I went for the interview, I put my CV in, and they said, I'm going to get the job. Man, I already resigned the other job, and then they phoned me and said, I can't get the job. Oh, ye of little faith, why did you doubt? Somewhere in your mind, there was a thing that said, is it really going to work? Come on, I challenge your mind today. Am I really going to get it? Is it really going to be a breakthrough time for me? Okay, he says, so look away from the distractions 
By looking unto Jesus that you don't grow weary in your mind. So if I look at Jesus, my goodness, my house is going to be sold. Whoa, three buyers. Then I go look at the price and I look at the market and I look at the inflation. I wonder if that guy's really going to take the house. I really hope this thing is going to come through. I hope I'm going to help somebody here today. I hope, oh, you have little faith? Why did you doubt? The little faith he got on the water, the doubt made him sink. Okay? So James 1 verse 8 says the following. 7 says, you know, if you want to have anything, ask of God because God will give and will not be angry about it. But pray and don't doubt. Listen to ver- uh, chapter 4 from verse 8, I think. From verse 5. From verse do 5 you to think, 8. Oh. Do you think that the scripture saith in vain that the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? Okay, now listen to this. The spirit that dwells in us lusteth with envy. In other words, the spirit of God is envious about us that we must be like God. Okay, just take this. This is why Jesus says in John 10, 34, ye are gods. Does not your law say, I say you are gods. So listen to this. The spirit in us is envious about us that we must be like God. We must do like God. Jesus said, if I give you the spirit, the works that I do, you shall do also. If you pray, I pray. If you say, I say. If you go, I go. I mean, when will we get there when everything we'll do is led by the spirit? Everything is successful. Come on. It's promised over and over. Psalm 1. Everything you do shall prosper. You shall be successful. Christians, it's time to be successful. It's time to be prosperous. It's time to be... It's time to break through the promise of God. Listen to this. But he giveth more grace. Wow. Oh, listen to this. The spirit in us lusteth to envy. It's so envious that it's close to lust. That's how much God wants us to be like God. Then he goes on to say, he knows we're failing. So he says, but he gives us more grace. Amazing grace. He gives us more grace. Listen. Wherefore, he saith, God resisteth the proud, but give grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Okay. I hope somebody got that. Okay? So that your minds does not grow weary. Your minds must not faint. Therefore, you must have your eyes on Jesus. Hmm? So, uh, James chapter 4, of, you know, was it 4 verse 5 to 8, says the following. Cleanse your heart, you double-minded. Hmm? Okay, I want to get back to James chapter 1 verse 8, where he says, we must pray by faith, Without doubt. I don't know if I had quoted the scripture. I can't remember. Pray without doubt. Listen to what he says. For a double-minded man. For a double-minded man is unstable. In all his ways. Oh. Okay, just listen to this. Oh man, God must help you. I've preached this many times. Cleanse your heart, you double-minded, because the spirit in you is envious about you to have you fully for God. Chapter 1, verse 8. If you pray, you must pray without doubt. Then he puts the word doubt. He says, for a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. The only thing that is double-minded is a chameleon. A chameleon is the only double-minded thing. That's why whatever he touch, he changes to that color. Situations make him change. He's not stable. 
He changed for every situation. You put him on green, he becomes green. You put him on black, he becomes black. You put him on white, he becomes pale. I mean, he just changes. When he's calm, he's nice and yellow. When he's angry, he's black and dark. You know? Okay, so here comes the chameleon. You know, he's just funny because he's got two minds. Because his eyes work totally different. The one can look this way and the one can look this way. One can see a fly and catch it while the other one looks at the dragon and want to catch him and he starts running away. <laughs> Didn't you read the story of the chameleon? So don't be double-minded for a double-minded man is unstable. So Peter has got his mind. His eye is single. He's looking away from distraction and he starts walking. He looks at the waves and he starts getting double-minded. So he becomes unstable. So he goes with the waves, he starts sinking in and out, the waves, oh, you know. So Peter starts sinking because he starts getting double-minded. You know, the word doubt in Matthew 14 is double. Oh, ye that operated with a burst of faith, why did you get a second thought? Why did you double? So doubt is double-minded. So have faith without doubt. If you pray, you must not doubt. Doubt is, I pray, but I got a second thought. I wonder if this is going to work. Pray for my son's exams. Oh, oh, Father, we pray today, let, um, let Robbie pass his exams today. Oh, I know the child was so sick last night with the flu. I don't think he's going to make it. Jesus, please let Robbie really pass his exam. Oh, I, I, he went this morning, you know, his nose was still running. I don't know if he's going to concentrate on the exam. Here comes the paper. Mother, I failed. I knew it. <laughs> mm. This takes us to the old, old story of Mark 11. I want to do this simple stuff, not simple in simple, but simple in plain, before we get to the epistles. What's the epistles? It's the wife of the apostles. Epistles. Epistles. Okay, verse 14. Remember Jesus is walking and there's a fig tree and he walked to it and they find no fruit on it. We all know the old faith story. But tonight listen to this. And Jesus answered and said to it. How can he answer? So did the fig tree speak to him? Yes, the fig tree had no fruit. So it spoke loud. It says you can't eat from him. So Jesus answered the fig tree. Conversation there, man. No man eat fruit of the year after forever and his disciples heard it so jesus acts strange like you when your car doesn't perform you get out and you say you stupid car the stupid car but on the front it says bmw <laughs> who gives you the authority to change the name hmm? For seven years, it took you to work every day. You forgot to change the battery. It doesn't last forever. You heard the signs the last week already. It said, tuck, tuck, before it started. You didn't pay attention to the cry of your car. Please, my battery's flat. And then after three days, the car says, And the second time it says nothing. You get out and you start calling the car names. You answer it. He just spoke to you. Flat. You speak back. You stupid car. The stupid car. Now how must I get to work? Why didn't you, when it went well, spoke to it and said, you beautiful car. You know what? People will think you're nuts. If you speak to your car, my beautiful car, thank you for bringing me to work again. But nobody thinks bad. You get out in the parking lot, slam the door, and say, stupid car, even bad day. Is it funny we're used to speaking bad? What about start speaking good? But here's Jesus. He speaks loud enough that the disciples hear him. Okay, verse 20. And in the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter calling to remembrance. I mean, this was bad. It was just the following day and he had to call to remembrance. 
Sorry for that. I just saw it, you know. <laughs> Call to remembrance. Say then to him, Master, behold, the fig tree which thou cursed is withered away. Jesus answered, Say then to him, Have faith in God. 22 Amplified. Jesus replying said, Have faith in God constantly. Brother Kenneth Hagen Sr. used to tell us in his early sermons, the original would say, Have the faith of God. Rabba Shekamo, faith of God. Have the faith of God. Oh, Brother Hagen, bless his heart, he's in the cloud. Okay. Verse 23 For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he says shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Listen to Matthew 21, verse 21. Jesus answered and said to them, Verily I say unto you, If you have faith and doubt not, you shall not only do this which is done to the fig tree, but also if you shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the, to the sea, it shall be done. Okay. How shall it be done? If you say and not doubt. Okay. I don't want to come to your house and tell you stories now that I know of. But you all know your own stories. Have you spoken to things? Come, just be honest. Look at me with, you know, with honesty. Have you taken the scripture and started speaking to your finances, speaking to your health? You know, I remember when they did a PET scan on me and every single cell in my body was flickering with cancer. And I brought it here to our staff meeting on a Wednesday morning. And we packed all the 18 pages out here. Colored pictures of a body flooded with cancer with a note at the bottom, patient have approximately 30 days from Bloemfontein. Okay? With a PET scan from Pretoria. Put the two together, patient have 30 days. So we put it out here, and we got our staff said, let's march on this stuff and speak to it and said, this cancer disappeared out of this body. This cancer will die. It will not stay in this body. Okay, we walked over this. We got emails. What's going to happen if Kubis die? What's going to happen to the ministry if Kubis is there no more? You know, Annalise, myself, our whole family, our whole church, had no doubt we just said, we shall not die but live. And we shall proclaim the great works of our God. Now I want to tell you the difference. Not once did I think, what if I die? What if I don't make it through the cancer? To God be all the glory. But the single-eyedness, we helped ourselves by sticking our whole house, what Annalise did, through, full of scriptures. If you walked into the house, it was scriptures, scriptures. If I came to this, everybody was positive. Everybody just kept on speaking. Though they carried me into the church, though they helped me out of the car, though they helped me to come to this pulpit, the chair is still there, and I had to, they had to help me to sit down and press my stomach here, and I sat there shaking, my legs shaking, and I had to preach, you know? Hmm? I'm not boasting, I'm saying, I could have looked at the pictures, but you know what we did with the pictures? We walked on them and we decided, this, we're not going to see the Egyptians again. Like we say for Pharaoh, we're not going to see him again. We're going to keep our eyes on Jesus. He said, he sent his word to heal us and deliver us from all destruction. I shall be healed. I shall be well. I shall prosper. My house will be paid. My car payment will come in. That new job will come. They will receive my CV. My child's going to do well in school. This marriage is going to work. Somebody, this business is going to, God's going to help my son to get out of this thing. God's going to get my child out of prison. It's going to happen. And don't think what if. Because there was a song in the 60s that says, I don't believe in if. We should sing it. I don't believe in if anymore. If's an illusion. If is an illusion. It's like that water you see in the desert, but it's not there. When you dive, you hit the sand. <laughs> That's if. If is not reality. The reality is where you focus your eye. Single-eyed. Come on, somebody say, I take it. I take it. I take it. 
I'm going to help you today. Let's go to Matthew 16. This is a story where Jesus asked the disciples what men say that he is. And they said, you know, different stories. And then Jesus asked, who do you say? And remember, Peter came out with a revelation. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. Okay, Christ is the son. So if the whole creation wait for the sons of God to be manifest, it means it's waiting for the Christ. Without the comma. Man, I'm going to read a scripture within a while. It's going to truly bless you, okay? So, yes, Peter, revelate. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Peter, flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you, but my Father will. Now listen to what Jesus says. Verse 21. This is cool. From that time forth, Jesus began to show unto his disciples how he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Stop. Did Jesus mention the Romans there? Okay. Jesus didn't mention the Romans. He says, the priests, the scribes, the Pharisees, they're going to take me, they're going to deliver me, and they're going to crucify me. Where is he talking about? Just look here at the board. Jerusalem. Okay? Is it all right? Listen to this. This is going to help you a lot. From that time, he, they just said, you are the Christ. And Jesus changed the subject. He said, you know what? I'm going to be delivered in Jerusalem. They're going to, yeah, they're going to beat me up. They're going to crucify me in Jerusalem. Wow. Huh? Isaiah 50 verse 7 says, he set, he set his face like a flint towards Jerusalem. A flint, you know, is the hardest stone on earth. That's what they use in lighters. You touch the two flint stones together, it causes a light. So anything you take on a flint stone, you know, the flint stones. <laughs> Bless you. Okay. You take a flint stone and you take anything, a piece of iron, everything that's hard, and you touch the flint stone and it causes a spark to come forth. It's hard. That's why it causes a spark. Hmm? Jesus set his face, get this, like a flint towards Jerusalem. He says to the disciples, I must be delivered over to the scribes and the Pharisees, and I must be crucified in Jerusalem. And if you read John, he says, let's get up and go from here, when he tells the same story. So let's get up. Where are you going, Jesus? To Jerusalem. To do what? I'm going to be crucified. Jesus, look at that. No, I'm going to be crucified. Jesus, look here. No, I'm going to be crucified. Jesus, pay it. No, I'm going to be crucified. Jesus, there's another sick person. No, I'm on my way to be crucified. Set his face like a flint. So in other words, nothing can deviate him. He's got one single goal. I must go to Jerusalem. Come, disciples, you can come with me or you can stay. I'm going now to Jerusalem. Okay? You got that picture. Okay? So here he's starting telling them that he's going to Jerusalem. To be crucified. Listen to this, verse 22. This is awesome, man. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him. I mean, he just said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. They knew from scriptures that Christ must be crucified, Isaiah 53. Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be. Distraction. How, how, how can you go to England now? I mean, haven't you heard that there's a problem on, 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 on the airport? No, 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 no. I must go to, to England now. You know, I've got this job description. They gave it to me for three months, and I can make like 20000 a month extra than what I make here. And when I come back, they pay for my... No, 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 no. And mother comes, my child, have you seen the airport? They've got a lot of problems, you know. They've got a lot of strikes now. They're in Heathrow Airport. No, no, I'd rather stay. But does anybody know that how many times have you decided and then somebody comes with a second thought? 
and you change, and afterwards you said, I knew I should have done it. How many times have you said, I should have stayed with my first idea. I should have stayed with that first thing. I should have went when I said I was going to go. I should have done it when I knew I had to do it. Hmm? Be it far from thee. But what did we read? Jesus has got his face like a flint. Verse 23. This is going to break you through. But Jesus turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. You are an offense unto me. For you savorest not the things that be of God, but that's that be of men. I think the Amplified will say, verse 23, You are minding what partakes not the nature and quality of God, but you are minding the things of men. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. How many, how many sermons have you heard on take up your cross and follow me? Brother, you must take up your cross and follow Jesus. You must take up your cross and follow Jesus. Man, and we've been put under condemnation and we try to take up our cross. What is your cross, Kubis? What did Jesus mean when he said take up the cross and follow? Have you heard that before? And we heard these sermons. Oh, brother, you must deny yourself. Take up your cross. Listen to the context. I am going to where I know I must go. I'm on my way to Jerusalem to be crucified. I got my face like a flint. Peter, the best disciple, the strongest, boldest, most powerful disciple. Jesus said, let's go. Peter said, you can't go and be crucified. Jesus turned to the most boldest disciple. Get behind me, Satan. Your thoughts are double. You're not minding the things of God. You are minding the things of men. You are again double-minded. Don't you remember at the sea when you started walking? Now you've got two minds again. You know what I must do now, you're double-minded. Satan, get behind me. This is what Jesus thinks of a second thought. This is what Jesus thinks of a double-minded man. This is what Jesus thinks of the second thought. So you, if that second thought comes, be bold. Take up your cross and follow him. In other words, do what he did when he went to the cross. He put his face like a flint and said, get behind me, Satan. Pick up your cross. Follow him. I'm not going to get a second thought. There's nothing wicked and bad about that scripture. It's a motivational scripture. If you're on your way to something, don't be deviated. Don't get a second thought. Listen, my face was like a flint. Take up the cross, man. Did you get it? I thought that was an awesome revelation. It's not go suffer, go through trouble and trial. No, look what I did with my face. Take up your cross. In other words, go for it, son. If, if, if double thoughts come, if distractions come, turn to it and say, Satan. Why Satan? Because Colossians 1 verse 21 says, We were alienated from God by our wicked minds. So the mind gets a second thought. Who will put it there? Who's going to put the second thought? Who wants to deviate you? Who wants to distract you? Not your mother. The devil. My son, mother, get behind me, Satan. <laughs> no. You're not rebuking your mother. You're not rebuking Peter. You are coming against the second thought that want to deviate you. You know, when we left the denomination, want to put up the tent. What our parents said. How are you going to live? How, how are you going to look after yourself? I said, no, I don't look after myself. God look after me. Hmm? Everything tried to distract us. In the newspapers, they tried to distract us. Our parents tried to distract us. I said, God gave me a dream. We're going to put up the tent. Then we're going to get the drive-in. We're going to build a church. Then we've got to put up another tent that's bigger. Then we're going to build a bigger church. And here we are 25 years later. Hmm? Sickness tried to distract us. Cancer tried to distract us. When we started the TV, I mean, I can go on and on and on. What about your stuff? 
What about the prayers you pray? What about the decisions you've got to make? What about, you know, the business you're running? Everything. Where's your eyes? On Jesus, that is your leader and source of faith, or on all the distractions? <laughs> Look at this. I tell you, this day is a mess. No, it's not. It's Monday. Yo, this day, I tell you, this day was a bad day. No, it was Thursday. Hmm? You know, I can tell you, your words, so powerful. When we were young, Mondays was called Blue Monday. Were you, did you grow up in the Blue Monday? Who grew up in the Blue Monday season? Just put up your hands that the people can see. TV, just go over this. This is the people that was there in the 60s. If you were not there in the 60s, you didn't know about Blue Monday. I still don't know where it comes from. But listen to this. On Monday was washing day. Everybody washed clothes on Monday. And they used a blue little cake that they put in the soap in the washing machine. Blow soap. You remember? It was a little cube. They always put it inside, and the washing machines had this little wheel in the center. They put the washing in. I mean, put your hand in there, your hand's gone. I mean, that thing just rubs the clothes in there, and you're gone. You remember? You remember? And every Monday, my mother woke us up like this. Come, 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 come. It's, it's Blue Monday. It's time to go to school. Blue Monday, Blue Monday. And you know what? On a Monday, this is what they say. Everything goes wrong on Monday. You know, because it's Blue Monday. It's going to be a blue winter. <laughs> Who remember Virginia Lee? <laughs> huh? <laughs> but I was a small little boy. So my mother always used to say, bring me the blue cake, blow so. Bring me the blue. And I always ran, you know, it was always in a box of about eight of them. You took one out, you know. And I said, come on, it's Blue Monday. And I always connected it with a little blue book, yeah. cube that you put in the It's Blue Monday, so you put the blue thing in. <laughs> when I grew older, I realized that blue means bad. Song, song, blue, everybody knows one. You know, blue is, man, when you feel real bad. <laughs> and you want to get your feelings out, you kick your guitar and you sing the blues. What's blues? My mama told me that's when bad things happen to good people. You take your guitar and you play the blues. And you get all that bad out of you. <laughs> you know the blues. Is the guitar? It's not on. Mm -hmm. I'll just play it here by my by my by my little mic. Blues is like. <laughs> Did it come through a little? And I realized, on a Monday when we came home, my mother was in a shape. Oh, you know, but it's, everything went wrong today. It's Blue Monday. No, it's not Blue Monday. It's Monday. Why do you want to call things bad if you can make it good? If the eye is single, the whole body will be flooded with light. Colossians, you know, Philippians 3. Philippians 3. Verse 7 and 8. But what things were gained to me, those things I counted lost for Christ. Yea, doubtless. Would you mark doubtless? In other words, there's no doubt about what I'm going to tell you now. Are you all right? Yes, doubtless. I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. For whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung. It's a bad word. That I may win Christ. 
I will not translate it in Afrikaans. <laughs> Remember we did Galatians 2 last night, 19 and 20, where Paul says, it's no longer I that liveth, but Christ that liveth in me, and the life I now live, and stuff like that, okay? And be found in him, listen, here it comes, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ. The righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him, and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, be made conformable unto his death, and by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Not as I have already attained it, already made perfect, but I'm grabbing for that which Christ has grabbed me for. Okay, verse 15. Let us therefore as many as be perfect, thus may be thus minded, one mind. And if anything, anything be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Mm. Paul says, there's no doubt. Okay, I'm just taking the word doubtless and put it in another word. There's no doubt that I've count all things but dumb. <laughs> For one thing, <laughs> to gain <laughs> the knowledge of Christ, the Son of God. No doubt, that's what I count other things. Poofies. Dung. Kiao. Moop. Dung. I don't know how to explain the word dung. <laughs> Moo. Okay. I want you to get the picture. Paul is trying to paint a picture. We don't see the word dung, but he uses it. Paul says, I count everything else dung for the excellency of the price of the high calling in Christ Jesus. 